La Grenouillère, a floating cafe on the Seine just outside Paris. Here on a summer's day in 1869, two struggling young artists, Pierre Auguste Renoir and Claude Monet, stood painting side by side. They were soon joined by others, Pissarro, Sisley, Morisot, Caillebotte, Manet. They painted the river in bold new brush strokes and luminous colors, and in 12 short years changed the course of modern art. Major funding for this program was provided by the Eugene B. Casey Foundation. Additional support was provided by the Ann and Donald Brown Family Fund. The years 1869 to 1881 marked a momentous decade when a core group of artists developed a new aesthetic vision on and around the River Seine. Their paintings captured the growing spirit of freedom and openness then spreading throughout the land. It was the beginning of modern, democratic France and one of the richest periods in the history of Western art. The Phillips Collection, America's first museum of modern art, has gathered 60 Impressionist masterpieces of this time and place. To celebrate its 75th anniversary, and to highlight the creation of the cornerstone of its permanent collection, Pierre-Auguste Renoir's exquisite Luncheon of the Boating Party. The Phillips Memorial Art Gallery, founded by American collector Duncan Phillips, opened in Washington, D.C. in 1921. It came to be known as the Phillips Collection. Two years later, Duncan Phillips bought Luncheon of the Boating Party for what was then a record price for a Renoir work, $125,000. It achieved everything my father hoped it would. It, it, uh, it, it did get that initial burst of publicity, and then from then on, it's, it's been just what he hoped, the, the centerpiece of the collection and reflecting many of the, the things that he cared most about in painting, freshness and individual vision, you know, the, the artist sees differently kind of thing. And for those days, it was a very different vision. If you have a little time, the pictures will tell you where they are to be. It's like, it's like working through a piece of music. The first time you run it through, the rhythms won't be quite what you want. The arrangement won't be perfect. But if you let the pictures sort themselves out, uh, little refinements happen that often bring an exhibition alive. It was, a, it was a very exhilarating feeling to see the paintings on the walls all together, uh, hanging together as though they were meant to be gathered in this way. When it was finally up um, and we went into the galleries for the first time, I started of course to well up because it was so beautiful I couldn't believe it. In the late 1860s, Paris had a new rage, trains. Parisians could take excursions out of town via the new rail system. It was quick, inexpensive, and available to all. Small villages along the river soon became popular weekend destinations for a rapidly emerging middle class. Within 30 minutes, one could be picnicking in Bougival, walking in Argenteuil, boating in Chateau, or enjoying a boisterous outing at La Grenouillère, which was always thronged with people. Monet was living in Saint-Michel, which was very near Bougival, and Renoir was staying with his parents in Louveciennes, and they went out and set up their easel side by side and started to paint. 
Uh, Monet, for example, was uh, very interested in, as he was later in his career, in the water, in light on the water, using color to denote light and shadow. Renoir is much more interested in what the figures are doing. You feel as though he's showing you everything that he saw on that day. He's included boats, he's included people, he's included all of their activities. Um, it's almost as though he's taken a photograph. We really can see two very different artistic temperaments at work, in spite of the fact that they've chosen to paint the same scene, more or less. Renoir's painting is much more intimate in character than Monet's. He's much more engaged by the figures who are in the painting, their costumes, and we become charmed by what they're doing there. Whereas in Monet's painting, he distances you from the figures, and he shows his extraordinary ability already to paint reflections on the surface of the water. His truly great interest. Renoir was a painter who always looked to the past. He loved 18th century pictures. He was uh, very inspired by Boucher and Watteau and Fragonard. He educated himself at the Louvre, looking at artists of the past. Monet, on the other hand, really felt the outside world was his teacher. He felt that he was doing art of now, and looking to the past really did not appeal to him. La Grenouillère was the first of a number of locations where Renoir and Monet would paint together. These sailboats were painted side by side in 1874 and have not been exhibited together since 1908. I think Monet does edit the landscape a bit. It's a more tightly constructed composition. Renoir, on the other hand, seems to include uh, lots of, of different activities going on, different boats and, and birds and all sorts of things, and makes a snapshot of what he saw that day. Both men were clearly experimenting. They often had little money and few supplies. We all don't eat every day, yet I am happy nonetheless, because, as far as painting is concerned, Monet is good company. This landscape painter's craft is difficult for me, but these months have taken me further than a year in the studio. Pierre-Auguste Renoir. The river opened up new possibilities, and it inspired them to experiment with color, movement and light. Their work that summer marked the beginning of Impressionism. In the early 1870s, Renoir and Monet were joined by others. Bert Morisot, Alfred Sisley, Camille Pissarro, and Gustave Caillebotte. All came to paint outdoors by the river. Their families came from different social backgrounds and were bound together by the loosest of ties. But the river was a major motif for them all. Some of them had known each other since their student days. and They met um, because they were young painters, all struggling together. There was no electric light, and when the light was no good or failed at the end of the day, they all poured into a nearby cafe. For Bert Morisot, the river was a break from work spent on urban life and figure painting. She painted the river from a more detached point of view, away from the hubbub of the banks, in scenes that were quiet and intimate. She was from a very nice family, an upper middle class family, and she really did not have the freedom to go to La Grenouillère to paint some of these more racy subject matters. We've included her beautiful view of Paris from the Trocadero with the river running through it. Um, it's a, a work that really uh, shows the importance of Paris and the importance of the Seine in Paris to the Impressionists. It's really where they began painting the river. But the Seine was often anything but quiet. It was alive with commerce. Cicely and Pizarro both were interested in the local people who lived on the Seine and worked on the Seine, whether it was the washerwoman 
or the men dredging sand out of the bottom of the river. And this is all part of the flavor of what life on the Seine was about in the 1870s. The Seine was central to the life and culture of France at this time. The river linked city and suburb, town and country, farm and sea. It was the symbol of Paris, the icon of France, the setting for both art and fiction. Along its banks, one saw a vision of an awakening nation. The promise of the French Revolution is borne out in the lunch and the boating party. We see in that painting three different levels of French society intermingling, fraternizing, and enjoying this wonderful meal on this beautiful day. Renoir wouldn't have taken that for granted. He had, he had lived through some very difficult moments in modern French history and wouldn't have taken this beautiful day on the river for granted. There were vivid memories and tangible evidence of the wars and civil strife which had racked France for almost a century. We see signs in these paintings of France rebuilding itself. In his uh, Bridge Under Repair in Argenteuil, Monet paints, it is a construction site. It's, that's exactly what it is. Although we're perfectly aware of that, we are spellbound by this beautiful sunset that comes to us across the water by the perfect reflection of the bridge so that you can scarcely tell where the reflection begins. Everywhere there were signs of change and progress. But the Salon, France's official artistic showcase, was still the arbiter of taste. 40,000 people visited the Salon held each year in Paris. Dealers, art lovers, critics. It was the way to be discovered and could make an artist's career. But the jurors bore a distinct prejudice against these new paintings of Renoir and his friends. In April of 1874, knowing they would not be accepted by the Salon, Renoir and his colleagues held their own exhibition in Paris. It had been five years from the time he and Monet had painted side by side at La Grenouillère. Hostile critics labeled the artists impressionists. They continued to paint. That summer, Renoir and Monet were joined in Argenteuil by Edouard Manet. Manet was principally a, a figure painter and a painter of urban subjects. He was regarded by everybody as the, the head of the avant-garde, the leader. This was probably one of the most important summers in the history of Impressionism because for the first time these three artists painted together. Renoir and Monet, of course, had painted together on several other occasions, but Manet arrived and really uh, inspired the younger, his two younger counterparts to look at what they were doing um, in a different way. You had Monet living in Argenteuil. Uh, Manet had a house across the river. Renoir was around a lot. Um, there was one day, in fact, when they all painted together in Monet's garden. Observing Monet at work on his small studio boat, Manet admired the younger painter's ability to capture the mystery of water and all its moods. He called Monet the Raphael of water. In the open air, Manet's palette lightened, and in a break with his usual style, he focused on landscape. Yet he did not abandon his love of portraiture. As a composer, Manet was extraordinary, and as you see in Boating, there are other elements of the painting besides the two figures that are crucial to its composition. You are in the boat. You are up close. It's very immediate, and at its time that would have been shocking to, be, to, be, to have that closeness as if you were there. 
uh, I think that Renoir, seeing Manet tackle the kind of subjects that he and Monet had already been uh, doing for some years, must have inspired Renoir enormously. Manet gave Renoir the sense that a great figure composition could be done out of doors. Renoir seems to begin to turn more and more to figure painting. And Monet never stopped exploring the beauty of water. Eighteen seventy four was the last year Monet and Renoir would paint together. In 1875, Renoir traveled to Chateau for the first time and began to make great friends with the Fournes family. Uh, Monsieur uh, Alphonse Fournes was the proprietor of the restaurant and hotel. Renoir painted his portrait, and the year after he spent the summer with Manet, starts to dream about doing a large figure painting. He becomes a little less the landscapist and a little more the figure painter. To me, uh, the rower's lunch suggests that Renoir could have gone either way. Beautiful, soft brushwork, uh, incredibly beautiful light. He could capture very specific moments, very particular effects of light. Renoir's interest in portraiture was bolstered by his friend Gustave Caillebotte, a fellow painter, wealthy patron, and avid boater. I think Renoir included him in the boating party in such a prominent position because of their great friendship. He also purchased a lot of Renoir paintings as well as paintings by some of the other Impressionist painters. He built boats, he raced boats, and became a great boatsman. Up to about the 1850s, you were either a fisherman um, who fished for a living or you were a wealthy person with a boat. Um, but in the 1850s and primarily in the 1860s, this was all opened up. The middle class could boat, and it became a hugely popular activity. Kaibot was inspired by Manet, but he also uh, brings a, his own particular uh, spirit to his work. In the painting of Oarsman, you're in the boat. Um, there's no horizon. It's water and boat, that's it. He was very interested in compressing the space and doing some rather daring foreshortening. He was probably quite inspired by photography, what he could see at his time. And his paintings have a, a modern feeling to them that is undeniable. Throughout the next five years, the group continued to explore the river in paintings that featured a sense of immediacy, spontaneity, natural light, and bold brushstrokes. Renoir, meanwhile, continued to focus on people. In 1880, the novelist Emile Zola reviewed an exhibit of Impressionist paintings and issued a challenge. He remarked that um, the masterpiece of Impressionism had never been painted. The great summary picture didn't exist. He said, oh, there are flashes of brilliance here and there and some good small pictures, but the great masterpiece of this movement doesn't exist. I don't think it's a coincidence that a few weeks later, a couple months later, Renoir orders a big canvas. I am at Chateau. I'm doing a painting which I've been itching to do for a long time. I'm not getting any younger. One must, from time to time, attempt things that are beyond one's capacity. Pierre-Auguste Renoir. So wrote Renoir in 1880, describing his attempt to paint Luncheon of the Boating Party arguably the finest painting of his career. It was the dream that had haunted him now for 11 years. 
Ever since that summer day, he had painted La Grenouillère with Claude Monet. And he had the individuals you see in the painting come and pose from one by one uh, during the course of several months. Renoir was very confident. There are no oil sketches, there are no drawings, there are no oil studies. There's no preparatory work related to this painting. He held the whole composition in his head. But it was a struggle. Detailed X-ray analysis and other scientific studies have revealed that Renoir reworked his composition numerous times. It had never been examined technically before, uh, and there were lots of questions about the picture. The uh, area that drew my attention first when looking at the picture was the area of the awning, uh, where you see lots of brush strokes from an underlayer, which have nothing to do with the shape or the form of the awning and what they come from was a first state of the picture where the landscape extended all the way to the top of the canvas. He originally conceived of the composition without the awning and he put it in later. One of the more dramatic changes in the picture is the man in the top hat. Both he and the gentleman that he's talking to were lowered in the composition. Uh, when he put the awning in, they probably looked too tall for the composition. Other changes that he made were in the figures. He adjusted their positions uh, on the canvas. The most radical one was the woman with the dog down here in the uh, X-radiograph. It's very clear that it was a totally different figure. She's looking out at the viewer. Uh, her arm is folded up against her side. Her dress is completely different. She has a three-quarter length sleeve dress on. The adjustments that he, he made in the figures were made to uh, have them interact more, to become more of a group. And what a group it was. All friends of Renoir, they represented a mingling of social classes totally new to France. Gazette des Beaux-Arts editor Charles Effruzzi and his personal secretary, along with fellow journalist Maggiolo, share the balcony with well-known actress Jeanne Samory from the Comédie Française. Renoir's fellow impressionist, Gustave Caillebotte, relaxes with Mademoiselle Angèle, a popular model, as is Ellen André, sipping just behind. Aline Charigot, Renoir's future wife, sits with her dog in front of Alphonse Fournez, the son of the proprietor, while his sister pauses to chat with Baron Barbier, a wealthy customer. You were on that balcony, you were with those people. The glasses to her lips, there's this feeling of a moment and, and all the figures in the work are engaged by that moment. This picture is extraordinary in so many different ways. You've got one of the most beautiful still lifes in the entire history of Impressionism. It's also a great group portrait. And the background? The background is, of course, a great Impressionist riverscape. It, it is all three of those things, landscape, portraiture, and still life. As Duncan Phillips once said, he thought art should be joy-giving and life-enhancing. I think there's no other work in the collection that you could describe more fittingly that way as joy-giving and life-enhancing than the luncheon of the boating party. It really is the work that sums up all he was trying to do during the decade, the main decade of Impressionism, um, showing contemporary life, showing the importance of the river and of uh, leisure on the banks of the river, something that was so important to all of these painters. They were painting the real world, not religious, mythological, or historical subjects, but real people and real situations. It was a great revolution in 
in art, in ideas about art, about what a painting could be, what the subject of a painting could, could be. And it, it brought all these young painters together. There was a spirit abroad in the land which hadn't been there before. People saw and understood and felt that anything was possible. And for these young painters, uh, anything was possible. And they went out and did it. Major funding for this program was provided by the Eugene B. Casey Foundation. Additional support was provided by the Ann and Donald Brown Family Fund.